All right. So let's get the party started. Um, so the clean, pragmatic architecture. If you Google architecture on Wikipedia, a fundamental structure of a software system and the discipline of creating such. Uh, no, my friend. Architecture. Architecture is the stuff that matters. Architecture is the stuff that's hard to change later. The art of drawing lines. This is my favorite, really. See, this is architecture is not just. It's how you can uh, solve your main problem with the simplest solution. In my opinion, this is the goal of architecture, to simplify the implementation of the most complex part of your system, right? This is the, the ultimate goal. Quick words about me. Um, I'm Victor Renta. I'm a Java champion, coding Java for 15 years already. Uh, a lot of training I'm doing these days in many, many companies throughout the world. Uh, and my topics are Spring, Hibernate, Java, functional programming with Java, domain-driven design, architecture, clean architecture, clean code, unit testing, performance and reactive programming. These are the topics that I do in, the op in companies basically every day uh, these, uh, these days. I also do conferences and meetups like I do with you today. So this is a bad animation happening but anyway uh, i do company training i do master classes that you can join and i also have some video courses uh, on teachable pre-recorded with very hardcore stuff in the, in them these are all very intense as will be the talk today i also have a channel on youtube a community that you've heard before from anna the previous speaker and i have very thin blog yet okay i have this website that you can uh, find more details about me and this is my email in case there are any questions after following this video this this talk please email me with your uh, with your questions all right chapter one <laughs> dtos are evil this is something very very important today in a world uh, in which uh, microservices are 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 growing in important are are, are um, appearing popping everywhere. So DTOs are evil. I want to get this straight before we even begin. DTOs are uh, data structures that we can actually that we can actually receive in our API or we can consume from the system that we talk to ourselves. Okay, now. Um, you shouldn't implement complex logic on foreign data structures. Now, this is something that took me years, uh, and it, it took us years to realize this. You shouldn't implement complex logic on foreign data structures. And I see this happening in the companies that I go. I see people working heavily, writing heavy logic on DTOs that they receive from their clients or that they expose in their APIs. Now, why is that? And first of all, what is complex logic? And then what's foreign? What do you mean foreign? Let's get them all one by one. So wh why shouldn't we write complex logic on, on DTOs? Because the DTOs are typically bloated. They have much more fields than we actually need in our logic. And you will end up passing to a method, a data structure that has 15 fields or 10 attributes, not just three or four, which are actually being used. So propagating a data structure, which is extremely heavy through your code, can do harm in maintainability, can um, make it harder to understand what really goes on in that function, right? Then this is, uh, these DTOs that I mentioned are typically out of our control. We can't actually add code to them because they are typically generated from some YAML files or they can, be, they can come as a package to, uh, inside a client library sometimes. Okay? So it's, they're out of our control. They are also typically mutable, and that's bad in whenever you have to implement complex logic. Uh, and very important, they bring to our system a different perspective, a different mindset. They might structure the stuff differently. And very often, the DTOs that we uh, receive or that we expose in turn are, um, are um, preferably flat are preferably without any nested data structures. Whereas in our entity model, in our logic, we want to work with rich, deep objects, not just flat structures. So we want the API models that we use or that we expose are different than the things that we want to use inside our logic. Okay. And uh, also very important, the DTOs don't carry constraints typically. They don't have like not null checks. They are not nice to us. They don't return to us optionals in the getters. They, they have no protection for their invariants. They are just collections of data, data structures. Okay. And which prob uh, what probably is the most important thing is that the details will diverge in time. 
Although if at the beginning of the implementation they look just the, just like our internal structures, with time, especially in a microservice ecosystem with multiple clients for the same APIs, the DTOs will grow. And then you will break the interface segregation principle from solid and you will end up using an interface which is used by multiple clients which contains stuff used by other, other systems that you don't care about. Right. So the, the DTOs will diverge if your ecosystem is successful, if it doesn't die. Right. Okay, so there is a curious case that I want to co cover with you. I've, I've seen it in some companies and it produces a lot of confusion, um, which has to do with the question, um, what's foreign? I, I told you, never implement logic on foreign data structure, but what is foreign to, to your system? And there is this weird species of, 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 of microservices around, which I call, which, which they are called nano services. They, these can also be, for example, the function as a service. If you deploy a Lambda to a cloud, it's the same thing. These super tiny bits of logic, uh, they are typically maintained by a cluster of, of developers. They are, you can, you can often hear that this team is managing 20 or 15 or, or 7 microservices. In that case, that they are not no longer microservices in the strict sense. They can probably be nano-services. Now, what's the difference? Now, if the same team is managing 3 systems or 7 systems, there is a problem. I need to tell you something before we even... Con I don't like nano-services. I think they are over-engineering. They are, they are an extreme form of microservices, but still, it happens. So you will be ending up, you will be ending up in this ecosystem or writing code here and here in the same week, perhaps, and wanting to bring data from here to there. Now, if you would not allow the DTOs on the wire to enter your, 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 the, the core of these systems, then you will need to map. You need to map these data structures to different data structures here and different data structures here. And this mapping over here gets many people annoyed. And in the case that you, a single person, a single team is, is managing both systems, then that's an extreme case in which you could share the DTOs with, uh, between multiple systems and freely use them inside your logic. Because it's actually this, these DTOs explain the ubiquitous language, the bounded, con the, the understanding of this team. So again, the social boundaries are super important, okay? If the team manages a set of systems, I see no terrible problem if the, the DTOs are carried, are, are, are used inside these little, these little systems. However, this is dramatically different than, uh, from the case in which you call a system implemented by another team. That other team has other, under, has under, other uh, understanding about the world, other constraints about the data structures, other f sets of fields and, or, 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 and different perception, right? So never allow a DTO from another team to enter one of your systems, okay? That would be it. But again, I, I need to repeat, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of these. I think these lead to a lot of pain for really little gain, really. Now, what am I trying to say here is that you should decouple, you should defend your domain, your internal system from the DTOs that you send and receive in your APIs. All right. Now, this decoupling, um, uh, it comes with a price, it comes with a price. Uh, you need to create more classes, the, the DTOs, and you need to convert from one to another, the mapper. Now, for creating additional classes, there are ways we found to make our lives easier, such as generating artifacts or packaging them in a jar and sending the jar to our clients, which is in some, ex some situations acceptable, right? Although, indeed, I must say that the uh, most widespread technique I see today is generating artifacts very based on some YAML or maybe contract, consumer-driven contract tests. But in both cases, you, the data structures that you send or receive to others are out of your control. You can't really add logic to them. You shouldn't add logic to them, no matter the case. Then the mapping. Also, we, 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 got a, we found a solution to get that rid of our, of our lives also, which is to use auto-generated mappers, such as Mapstract, which can convert from an entity to a data transfer object as long as their fields match. So as long as you have first name in entity and first name in DTO, then they will be automatically copied to one, from one to another. But that's a very 
dangerous temptation that will that will um, provide incentives for developers to keep the two models in sync to keep the DTO model and the entity model in sync which is not really I mean which is which basically defeats the purpose we created the DTOs to be able to have a, a different set of data structures we want to build ourselves a, a more rich entity model a more rich domain model right you don't want to keep the two in sync no, you, 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 you really don't want that. Uh, you create a DTO in order to, for them to evolve differently and for you to be able to craft your model without thinking ab about breaking your clients. Okay? Very, very tricky, this one. So as a summary here, uh, the foreign data structures are bloated, means, again, I want to repeat these points. They contain extra fields than we really need, and we really wanted to have very focused data structures. If a method uh, operates on two strings and an integer, you don't want to pass it a structure that has uh, 12 attributes. You want to pass a structure which is as focused as possible, right? Especially if your logic is very complex. Right. All this discussion we have today um, um, starts from the assumption that you have sufficient complexity in your application. If your application is very thin and stupid, I'm sorry, then you don't need all these bazookas. You, you do your stuff as simple as possible. But if the complexity starts to pile up, or if you foresee, if you know that your application will have sufficient complexity, then you don't want to propagate DTOs. Fixed design, I, I told you, you can't add logic in the DTOs that you manipulate because they are out of your control, right? And we want to push logic, as much logic, closer to the data as possible, to be wider reusable and uh, to provide a better semantic in our, in our, in our entities, to provide a, a richer uh, meaning to the, to, the, to the structures, to those objects that we work with. So the end goal is here to simplify the, the core domain logic, right? And we do that by pushing some of the, that domain logic into the entities that we manipulate, into the, uh, the structures that we manipulate. Now, mutu mutable is bad. We love immutable objects, especially for complex uh, computations. Um, about um, the details come with a different perspective, the understanding about that concept of the team from which we got the DTO, right? Um, whereas we want to build our own rich and deep domain model, we don't want flat structures. We want, like, for example, customer. I don't want the customer to have a first name and a last name. I want the customer to have a full name, which is a structure that contains inside the first and the last. Sorry for drawing on the screen like that, but you get the point. Constraint. I want a model which is nice to me, which, does, does, which, which never gives me nulls, which either rejects nulls, in the constructors or, or mutators, or it provides me optionals in its getters. All of, about all these topics I've, I've, I've spoken in other um, uh, previous presentations. And then again, about diver diverging in, in time, DTOs will eventually change. We will eventually diverge. So we want the freedom to be able to focus uh, our structures to help us in implementing our biggest complexity, our biggest uh, problem, basically, right? Okay, so that's about data structures, a very important chapter in the microservice world, I'm afraid. But now let's look at this piece of code. Uh, this is the code, in case you wonder what this painting represents. This is the perception of code as from an anonymous developer, okay? So this is code, this is how code looks if you don't do anything about its structure, about enforcing some lines, some boundaries, as I said. So let's put some boundaries on it. First of all, on the top, please imagine there is your API. Uh, you could expose to a browser, you could expose to another microservice, I don't care, to a mobile app, whatever, whoever is your client is on the top, and your database is here safely, as long uh, as well as the APIs that you need to interact with from other applications. So we impose layers, and all the applications I see today in Java, they have controllers, services, and repositories. This is like a, the ubiquitous architecture today. Uh, and, but there, is some, there are some problems with that, as I will explain. Um, this, these layers that we put in place are, is, as you can see, vertical layers. They separate, um, um, I don't need to explain more because I guess all of you have this. But there is another way of separating the application, which I will not talk today about, which is very important for larger monoliths, which is to separate bounded context within the same application. 
It's, an, it's the unfortunate case, maybe unfortunate case, in which you have a large application, a successful one for sure, because it's still there, which has grown into a big, big one million line of code, for example, application, and there are things happening in there which really are unrelated and they shouldn't couple to each other. But that's another story. How, how do you decouple vertically the subdomains of your application? That's a completely different story, not for today. I will focus on layers with you today, and I want to introduce an additional one. And let's name that application service. And you've probably heard of it if you read a bit about domain-driven design, but I will call it facade, because I have a, pretty, a slightly different understanding of what it does, and I, as I will explain in the following. Now, this is a layered architecture, but you can call it a layered architecture only if you impose some, uh, some rules. And the rules are that you, can never, you are never allowed to call upwards. What do I mean? You should, never, uh, you should never call from a domain service into an application service, or even worse, from a repository into a domain service. Although there, there are cases in which you might be tempted to do so. Whenever complexity um, piles up in the repository and you feel like calling back into a domain service because it's so big in there, then what I will advise you to do, you take the stuff that was complex and you pull it up in the domain service, letting the, depend letting the calls only go downwards. This is when you can call it a, a layered architecture if your calls only go in the same direction. Okay, A bit of boring theory over here, but it's important to stick to these ideas only call downwards okay and it can cause some interesting refactoring such as moving code from here to there or, or even in more interesting moving from domain services to application services anyway okay so all this application service so this facade layer that i've introduced this thing uh, is basically an application of uh, one very subtle principle of programming which is called separation by layers of abstraction which means that you shouldn't do at, uh, at these layers things which um, refer to very low detail. So the goal is to have the top level view of what happens in the system as clear as possible from the very beginning, from the application service. You shouldn't need to dive into all the domain service, all the repositories to, to get the big picture. The big picture should be clear from the, from the first entry point, from the application service. Okay? Now, of course, if you have more than uh, much more complexity, just imagine the use case to place an order in an eShop. It wouldn't be enough to have just the application service and a domain service. I would probably want to have an, one or two more uh, layers of abstraction there to simplify and to build a universe in which I can construct stuff much easier. So don't, don't be keen on just two layers, all right? Oops. Then, um, so the facade, the, the, um, the application service works like, a, like, a, like an orchestra, like the director of, a, of an orchestra, right? Um, telling components what to do. Now, before we continue, I have to, to bring something to your, uh, uh, to introduce a concept, which is very interesting. Uh, many managers, even some old school leads or seniors, believe that building software looks like this, putting layer after layer of concrete, building, just constructing more features without ever touching the layers below. So just adding stuff. This is, of course, not how it feels in practice, but the code is organic. The code is like a garden. And by the way, that's a um, movement. You can Google it up. It's called the software gardener. I think it's originates from, from Greece, if I'm not mistaken. The acknowledgement of the fact that the code needs continuous trimming and care. If this bush grew too big, you should need to trim it. If this class grew too big, you need to cut it into pieces. If, if there, are, there is grass functionality that shouldn't be here, trim it. So code needs continuous care. So keep this in mind for the next, episode, for the next section. So here we are implementing logic. So you have to implement features. Of course, and the business will keep pouring features on your head, of course. They will ask you to implement this and that and that and do that bath fix and so on. And then of the, the, typical, um, the typical path for that functionality is to be placed in a service. That's what most teams today are doing in Java. That's like the de facto architecture with services containing all the, the business logic. 
Now, after you read a certain, a certain book, you will be tempted to push much more logic into the entities, into the data structures, and go for a more rich domain model with behavior, with constraints, with uh, null checks, with, with safety, basically, and expressive methods very, on which you can, you can, you can build very uh, easy your domain logic. Now, this, this pushing of logic, no, um, few teams in practice are able to push more than, I don't know, 10% of their business logic into their aggregates and entities. Uh, some achieve more, but most of us are here. Even so, this 5 or 10% of logic that you are able to push into data structures will help enormously because they are typically simplifying the most complex parts of your logic. Those things that you put inside are super useful in practice. But besides services and entities, we need another place. We have now um, the facade or the application service. Now, there are out there two main ideas in play when you are designing an application service. The first idea is to create a, uh, an application service for every single use case. That would lead, that's dangerous in my opinion, that would lead to uh, get user by ID class application service which is uh, 10 lines of code, but can also lead to place order application service with 2000 lines of code. So it's a dangerous um, rule to impose to, to a team because they can either lead to extremely small classes like 10 lines of code, what the heck is that? Or 10,000, it's, it's not enough. The second approach that I will present in the following, and that's why I call it facade because it's not as classic what I'm talking about here. This is, means to, um, to allow multiple use cases in the same facade. That, of course, runs the risk of the facade degenerating into a god object. So again, this is the orchestrator. Right? So how do I do it? How do I do it? I will continuously extract stuff that grows big from my facade into domain services. What do I mean? So imagine these are the facades, right? And they are talking in terms of DTOs in their, in, their, in their public methods. They are receiving from the controllers before. They are receiving the data DTOs that we manipulate, that we, that we expose in our API, right? These facades, I allow them to implement use case from alpha to omega completely. But if, but if such a use case is extremely short, like get user by ID, then it will result in a single method in the facade. Nothing else will get created. However, for many use cases that are complex, they will be promoted as domain services, extracted from the facade into domain services by, by watching very close to the size of these facades. They should never exceed, I don't know, 200, 250 lines, never. If they exceed 250 lines, the build should fail. That's, that, that, that is a risk of this approach that I'm describing over here. This is a non-standard approach. But it relies on developers reasoning and thinking and refactoring continuously, right? Every time, uh, so for example, get user by ID will be here, place order will be here and here and here and probably in three more classes surrounding that because it's so big. So the goal is to, 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 to promote from these uh, facades the complex logic into domain services, right? Now, this has a very interesting consequence because if you promote, if you, if you call from the facade into a domain service, I will make sure, as I will explain in the next uh, in two minutes, I will make sure that once I go to the domain service, I can never go back. What do I mean by that? I will put two, mo two modules, two separated modules into here, right? So that when I cross this boundary from the facade to the domain service, there is no way I can go back into the facade. Right. It in very. I. I. I am a developer. People. Developers think easy when they w see the code. If from the facade you go into a service, that service. Do I have the code ready, or I'm just no? I don't have the code. The, the. The. The customer service that I might create at some point will be in a different model, in a different module. In this module, I will know nothing about the external world, but from the facade, I will be able to call into the customer service, like I will demonstrate right here. Private handle customer service, 
customer service. Come on, IntelliJ. Service, thank you. So I can go from the facade into the customer service in a different module, but once I got there, I have no visibility back into, for example, a customer DTO. Customer DTO, it's not visible because I crossed the boundary. I am now in the domain. The domain knows nothing about where I came from. So very briefly, um, sketch thing code the idea if I cross the boundary this never sees anything from there which is very very good because DTOs are evil and I want to keep my logic the most complex of my logic safe separated from the DTOs that I receive or send in my API so the domain service I extracted these because they were complex and guess what they, they never see the details. So this is like a guarantee. Everything that gets complex in my application will, will be pushed in a place which, uh, from which it can have nothing to do with the API model, right? Which is very, 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 very cool. Right. The, 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 these domain services that I'm talking about will only receive entities and value objects and primitives. So nothing, nothing external, right? So as I, as I mentioned, two separate modules. Interesting. And I'll put them only in one picture at the end. No, don't worry. So what does the facade do in very brief uh, explanation? It will convert the DTOs to the entities because you can see if I, this needs to go inside, it needs to be converted, of course. So conversion, validation, transaction management most of the time, and also the most important role to orchestrate the workflow, to tell the domain services, the aggregates, what to do next. Okay. All right. So this is uh, this is like the the facade, right? Um, the facade. One more trick for you, however. If you ever imagine you are building an order management system, okay? An order, just imagine order management system, and then you create in one day a class named order service, and you put a method in that named place order. Just imagine order service dot place order. Just imagine, okay? Orders, we are in the order management system. The order entity in total with all the satellite value objects has, what, 100 attributes in total, right? It's three sets of children and, and you create order service place order. You should be afraid. You should be afraid of creating such an order service because in three years from now, that will be 3000 lines of code. Don't create services named like like core entities from your system it's risky it's extremely risky so try to make it more cohesive place order service you don't run the risk of it degenerating into a big ball of mud if you do that because look you can't really put much things in there can you you can't put cancel order so don't run risks with services that are named like big entities like central entities in your system okay no matter if you are doing official DDD or not, this is still a good practice. All right, now, then comes the, the um, let's put everything together, okay? We have 15 minutes left. Let's put everything together. There is code that you want to protect. All the code that you want to protect, you will keep in the domain module. It is like the fortress of your system, where the most important part, I once had a debate with a, with a training group, what the heck is domain logic? Um, if you want to simplify this, is whatever gives you headaches, whatever logic gives you headaches, whatever state transitions you have, which are complicated, whichever, whatever thing is complicated for your application, that could be con uh, thought of as a domain. It's not in, Eric Evans wouldn't agree with me on that, but it helps um, the teams to try to put what is precious inside your domain. Now. Uh, there will be domain services in there and domain objects. All right. Now, what's specific to your app would be the domain module, what's complicated in your app. But now what happens if the domain service wants to call outside an external service? If you call an external service from a domain service, inevitably you might end up accidentally uh, uh, being returned DTOs. You might, you might actually uh, get to see data structures which are coming from an external API, which are evil, very evil. So you don't want to let them pollute your precious domain. So what do you do? You don't call the external service directly, but instead you put in front of it an adapter. 
like in the GoF patterns, the adapter pattern over there. So the domain service will call the adapter, the adapter will call the external service. <laughs> I see you cry there. Okay, good. Uh, this adapter over here will m make sure that it shields your domain from all the garbage of working with the external API. And please consider that the, that as enemy. Okay, not garbage. Enemy. Now, if you if you lay your 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 module architecture like this, then uh, it means that the domain needs to know about the infrastructure because the domain class needs to be able to call into the adapter class, and that's bad. That's bad because the moment you see from here this, you will also see this. And you might by mistake slip this into your domain. You don't want that. You don't want the DTOs to be polluting your domain and you want to keep them. How do we do that in practice? We invert the dependencies. What do I mean by that? If you look cl close to what happens over here, I have extracted from my adapter an interface. Now, what does that mean? It means that the methods went into, a, into an interface which was moved into the domain. If you do that, you can invert the dependent. That's why the, the arrow there is so happy. Because it got inverted. Look what happened. From here, I moved it to there. Now, why does it have to be inverted? Because the adapter needs to know about the interface, not the other way around. And that allows a very interesting idea. It allows that in your domain service, whenever you want to call outside, you first express your, your intention into a class, into an interface, which talks in terms of your domain, your domain, right? Now, then you put on your gloves, <laughs> you know, those yellow gloves that come back to your, 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 your uh, elbow, and you go and you implement that interface by writing the adapter and working with the data structure that came from the outside with the whatever is there, LDAP, user, whatever structure that you brought in, you need to convert it into your holy entity uh, uh, entity model, your holy domain object. So this is the idea here. Now, we call it dependency inversion because even though we don't depend from the, uh, with our domain from the infrastructure, but we depend it uh, vice versa, we can still call the adapter at runtime. Because Spring is smart, or, or whatever dependency ingestion container you might have, is Spring enough to know what to do here. And it will inject you this. All right? Now, uh, if we extract the idea, it's called the dependency inversion principle, right? the D in solid. And it tells to keep your high-level policy, your high-level module, independent of low-level details. All right? uh, abstractions should not depend on details. The, big, the domain should not depend on external agencies or other of other microservices, right? And that effectively stops any data structure, anything from outside world to enter your domain, which is very good. Now, um, you can use this technique no matter, how, no matter how you integrate with other systems by sending messages or calling um, synchronous blocking um, calls. I don't care. You can use the same technique uh, described here to make sure the structures from outside or the API from my side never penetrate your domain. Okay. Now, classically, this was done by putting two modules like I did over here. You have the application module, which depends on the domain, you can see. And the domain knows nothing about the application, knows only about the core framework that I'm using. Of course, Lombok, Spring, and Hibernate, and this. Uh, whatever. Just uh, Spring and Lombok, basically. Right? Nothing else, if you look. Now, um, this is classically done by two modules, but I want to show you one more trick you could use. Just, just read this one. No classes that, first of all, what the heck is this? It's a test. A test? Really? A test of in what framework? The framework that I'm using is called ArcUnit. Pay attention to what happens over here, right? No classes that reside in a package service should depend on classes that reside in a package infra. Bang! You, you've done it. What, 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 what's this again? It's a, it's a, um, a static code analysis tool that looks at your bytecode um, and inspects the imports and dependencies that you have from classes in different packages. And, it, and if, you, if, you, if you play this to, uh, in your application, the, the build will fail. The Jenkins will, will, will crash the build. Wherever this, whenever this test fails. 
So this is like a lightweight version of enforcing these boundaries between packages, not by multiple, by, by, by multi, by, by multi module projects, but by static bytecode analysis, which can prove interesting for medium, small projects. For a large project on one which many people work uh, of, of different experience levels, very heterogeneous team, I would probably go for a compilation enforced, uh, 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 um, like with Maven modules. But if my team is cohesive and pre pretty determined and a small, medium, small project, then ArcUnit can just be enough. Or there are, of course, ports for others. But the goal, again, the goal is to keep your domain independent of any external stuff, to keep your domain agnostic, because that would allow you, that's a very interesting word, agnostic, agnostic to, to, to details from the outside world, because you want to be able to focus on your problem without thinking, oh, why is that API requesting me a node? What's that field in that structure? You want your domain to work with sharp, expressive uh, models, uh, and focus just on your problem, not on, not on integration stuff and other, other things, okay? Okay, so, um, agnostic domain is a goal, right? So, let's play this all together, five more minutes. We have the external API that we need to call. What we do there um, to defend our domain from the DTLs that they brought to us. But again, folks, um, I'm... Read, read between the lines. Sometimes not the DTO in them itself it, it, um, it's annoying, but the way of working, perhaps they are doing some messaging thing that you don't like. Perhaps they do, perhaps they use soap. Perhaps they use like the old style asynchronous rest endpoints, if you ever heard of that concept. You defend your domain from the integration mechanics, right? And I've seen cases in which I am fine from, for an adapter to, to, to write stuff in the database sometimes. There are cases in which you can actually in order to keep, to present a nice API to your domain, okay? And your, and your domain to be happy, perfect. Now, in front of you is, only, is also an enemy, it's your client. And the API that you provide to your client should be very um, stable in time. So the DTOs that you expose to them should be also converted to your domain objects. And th this is the role of the facade by means of either some mappers or, or map struct or whatever you, you choose to use, you convert these to these. But also always keep in mind that the DTOs are supposed to diverge from these. Don't don't strive to keep them in sync for, for too long. Okay. Okay. Which is the application module, if you like. All right. Um, but then there is also the database. Oh my God. The database. The database over there, some teams consider the database with good reasons to be their enemy. Their enemy. They believe about their database, it's their enemy. They, they think like, oh, those tables. Some really have a good reason for that. They might inherit a legacy schema with 500 tables, with tables of 200 columns. Of course, there are extreme cases in which you consider the database to be your enemy. In which case, you might want to use the same idea that we used for the adapter, dependency inversion, to defend your domain from the persistence concerns completely, from the schema completely. This oftentimes comes bundled with creating a separate persistence model. Imagine, please, like the customer uh, domain object. This is the customer uh, persistence entity over here. And this, there is another customer DTO in the front. Customer DTO, customer domain object, customer persistent ob entity. And every time that what the team is doing is mapping from here to there. I see a lot of anger in teams because of such abusive, <coughs> abusive extreme decisions, like to separate a persistence, uh, a, a, a sh completely disparate persistence model. I believe this is a mistake for most applications that we start today. Because you, if you learn enough if you learn enough Hibernate, if you learn enough persistence, frameworks evolved enormously from 15 years ago, and um, you have great freedom. You, 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 can, you can create an expressive entity model here while still persisting it in the database. And I have a talk about that uh, done for my community. Now, this is the famous onion architecture. Right. The, 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 the main point is that um, the core doesn't depend on anything external, but only the external depend on the in, on the only the details. The external world depends on the domain. 
Okay, this is the onion architecture. Now I'm a very pragmatic guy, as you as, as you probably realize. So what what I do? I cut out that persistence model. I say to myself, what the heck? The repositories are working on my domain entities themselves. So why 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 putting them out? Right. So what do I do instead? I merge everything together. Basically, I cut down the repository module and I merge everything together, which allows also for very interesting optimizations. For example, bringing stuff from the database directly to my front end. Anyway, uh, this I call it the pragmatic onion architecture. Uh, I think I, I am running a bit out of time. Um, I will skip this title, though it's very important. But I will I will move to the to the key points basically. So what were the main lessons today? And afterwards I will stick with you to answer any questions you have. DTOs are evil. They are coming from yeah. There are many talks I had on my YouTube channel and my check my website. There are there listed somewhere. DTOs are evil. Um, be afraid of them. Okay, they will change. They have different goals. You can protect your domain with dependency inversion principle or that RQUNI that I mentioned, that framework, that library. Then you would you should always try to keep to build yourself a deep, rich model that will help you solve the core problem in a, in the most elegant and simple, expressive manner possible. Okay, that that might mean introducing new value objects, like I mentioned, full name. Okay, that might introduce breaking the entity into three separate entities, stuff like that. Right? Never, never stop evolving your design to fit the added logic. Your logic, your complexity, your code complexity will always continuously grow. Never cease of searching for look for ways to break it down. Right? Understand the design goals. Read what Clean Architecture, the article from Clean from Uncle Bob. I really recommend you read it. But take it with a grain with a grain of salt. Be pragmatic. Okay, be pragmatic. Frameworks evolved enormously since those articles were written and always judge. Uh, is there any risk I'm defending from? So, uh, this is basically it. Um, this is my website in case you want to reach out to me, please do so. I'm also on Twitter. I think that's the most, that's the best way to reach if you have a focused question. That's a bit, um, yes, I have some code examples in my GitHub repository, just a second. Um, but again, like any um, archetype, don't take it ad literum. I mean, think, uh, criticize it. Don't, don't agree with it. Think what's good or bad in there. Okay. And check out my GitHub repository. I have a lot of stuff in there, like because I'm doing training every single day. Good. Um, back to the studio. <laughs>